Ben Parson, are you in? But am I on here? I don't see myself. I can hear. She's. <laughs> And you appear as Carol. We all muted. I can, uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. I'm asking Georgette for a new link. Oh. I stole yours, Carol, and I'm coming up with your name. <laughs> Hello. Carol, I just made you the host and I'm going to get off. Oh my goodness. Hold on there for a second. Uh, hold on for one sec. I think I might have done something funky here. I just left Ashoka message. It's fucking fresh. This has never happened before. I don't know what's going on. Carol, is there anything I can help with? I'm pretty tech tech savvy. Right now, I have only got. Oh, I'm good. All set. Okay, so do we have everybody in Brady Bunch view on top, and we can see the speaker down at the bottom? Mm -hmm. On my end, yes. I have that. Like Meg, when you just spoke, I could, I could hear you. Became my big picture at the bottom. Yeah, you have a choice at the top right to select gallery view or speaker view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, are you ready for me to call this meeting to order? I think we are. All right, then I will do that. Good evening. I'm Superintendent Carol Cavanaugh, and I am officially calling to order the Hopkinton School Committee meeting of Thursday, July 9th, 2020. Because this is the school committee reorganization meeting, I will um, go through the process of reorganization while we uh, elect a new chair of the school committee. Before I do that, um, I will read the script for remotely conducted open meetings. Um, in accordance with Governor Baker's order. So as a preliminary matter, this school committee meeting, um, and I uh, will be going through this process so that you can understand um, what we do when we have a remotely conducted open meeting. So permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on this agenda are present and can hear me. So school committee members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Nancy Cavanaugh? Yes. Meg Tyler? I think Meg is muted. Meg, are you muted? Um, <laughs> I can hear you now. Oh, there we go. Hi. Amanda Fargiano? Yeah, here. Leo Lafferty? Here. And Joe Markey? Yes. All right, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Jen Parson? Yes. And Susan Rothermick? and anticipated speakers. So we have three new hires who will be speaking on our agenda tonight. Please respond in the affirmative, Jennifer Sucker. Yes. Laura Tice. Yes. And Chris Ocampo. Yes. 
Okay. So I will go through this whole reading. Uh, good evening. This open meeting of the school committee is being conducted remotely consistent with the Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This evening, we will have public comment. For this meeting, the school committee is convening by Zoom webinar, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Additionally, the meeting may also be, the meeting will be broadcast by HCAM through one of its many channels or platforms. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website via the meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless when we have a new chair, he or she notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda, which is reorganization. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. Once we have a chair, the chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold your name until it is called. Further, please remember to mute your, micro your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do throw, so through the chair taking care to identify yourself. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. Tonight, public comment will be done through either email or text messaging. And those are all of the things that I need to read before we get started. So we are ready to begin with the first item on the agenda tonight. And the first item on the agenda is school committee reorganization. School committee reorganization each year is conducted in, a con in uh, accordance with school committee policy BDA. So for the purpose of organizing at its first regular meeting, Following the district's annual elections, the school committee will elect from its membership a chair and a vice chairperson. Both the chairperson and the vice chairperson will hold their respective offices for a term of one year or until a successor is elected. The superintendent of schools will call to order the annual organizational meeting and conduct the election of that chairperson. So the election proceeds as follows. Uh, what will happen first is I will take nominations for the office of chairperson. Those nominations will be made from the floor by another member of the school committee without the need for that nomination to be seconded. The chairperson will then be elected by a majority roll call vote of the members present, uh, present and voting. If no nominee receives a majority vote, the election will be declared null and void and nominations will be reopened. So at this time, I will take nominations for the role of chair of the Hopkinton School Committee for the 2021 school year. I would like to uh, nominate Amanda to be the chair. If Amanda is willing to accept that nomination. Amanda, are you willing to accept that nomination? You know, coming from the previous acting chair and then previous chair makes me a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> but I would accept that nomination. Thank you, Nancy. Are there any other nominations for chair? I would nominate Nancy because she's done a great job leading the school committee in the past month or two. 
All right, any other nominations for chair? Okay, so what we will do is we will go through these two candidates for chair. We will do it through a roll call vote and the first person to get a, um, a majority of the votes will obviously be the chair of the school committee for the 2021 school year because it takes a simple majority to become the chair. Um, so I will start with a roll call vote and I will, and we'll, the first candidate that we'll, we will consider will be Amanda Fargiano. And so I will turn to Nancy, um, roll call vote. Would you like to vote yes or no for Amanda Fargiano as <laughs> chair? I vote yes. Thank you. Um, Meg Tyler, voting for Amanda Fargiano, yes or no? I think you're mute, but I'm, I'm assuming that's a yes. 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 <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Leah Rafferty. Yes. <laughs> uh, Joe Markey. Yes. And Amanda Fragiano. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So it will be unanimous that Amanda Fragiano will be the chair of the Hopkinton School Committee for the 2021 school year. Um, now, upon your election, the new chairperson will preside calling for the election of a vice chairperson. So this is where I relinquish my role this evening to you, and um, you can look for a vice chair. Okay. So I will now accept nominations for a vice chair. I would like to nominate Nancy. Nancy, would you accept that nomination? Yes, I will. Thank you. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Okay, I will now conduct, I believe, a roll call vote um, to elect a vice chair. We have one nominee, this is Nancy Cavanaugh. Um, I'll start with you, Nancy. You appear first on my list. I vote yes. Okay, and Leah? I vote yes. Okay. And Joe? Yes. And Meg? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So Nancy Cavanaugh will be the vice chair for the coming year. Great. Congratulations. Um, does that conclude the reorganization component? That does conclude the reorganization po uh, component and we can begin with the third item on our agenda tonight, the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, great. I would now at this time invite anyone who uh, is able and willing to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. And to the and Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, that brings us to the fourth item on the agenda recognitions, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, so we have three recognitions tonight. Um, as you know, we had three um, administrative positions in the district this year that we were hiring for. Um, the first is the English Language Acquisition, Equity and Access Director. I know that is an awful mouthful. Um, as Jen Parson said the other day, when we were trying to come up with uh, Jennifer Sucre's nameplate, we were wondering how we were going to get all of those letters on a nameplate outside of her door. Uh, Jennifer Sucre comes to us from the Northboro Southboro Public Schools, and I will let her tell a little bit about herself to all of you. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having us, um, Dr. Kavanaugh. My name is Jen Sucre, as Dr. Kavanaugh stated, and I started teaching English as a second language in 2002 and have devoted my entire educational career to English learners. Um, I have taught grades K through 12. Um, with my most, most recent stint teaching uh, high school ESL at Algonquin Regional High School. And then prior to this year, I was the interim director of English language education for the public schools of Northboro and Southboro. It was a one year position where the person who held the position uh, took a one year leave of absence and is returning to it. So I was not able to keep that position. I was very, very excited when this position was posted in Hopkinton where I can use my experience um, as an EL program director and my experience working with English learners and families from K through 12 uh, in the Hopkinton schools 
And I'm also very excited about the equity and access piece uh, that is uh, vitally important in our schools and in our community right now. And I, I can't wait to serve in this role. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, we think, uh, Jennifer, you're gonna be a wonderful addition to our team. Uh, as the community knows, our L population has been growing steadily over the years, and we really do need somebody in an administrative role um, to kind of you know, govern that department. Um, and we are asking an awful lot of this new candidate because not only will she be overlooking the English learners, but um, she will be overseeing um, some of our work in the district, which is also very important in equity and access. So Jen, welcome. So good thank to have you. you. So much. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Um, our second new hire is Laura Tice. She has been a Spanish teacher at Hopkinton High School for some time, and she is going to serve in the interim role of assistant principal at the high school for the 2021 school year. So Laura, you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, uh, thank you all for having us tonight. I've been with Hopkinton Public Schools since 2012. So I'm, I'm very familiar with the great things that we do and the continued growth that we've had. And I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into this role and uh, continuing the work that Evan and Justin are doing in the, in the main office of the high school. Uh, I know some of you uh, had some of your kids, Nancy, I've taught Spanish to your daughter. <laughs> so it's nice to see some familiar faces right now. Um, I've already hit the ground running a little bit, working with Carol through some things and seeing Jen and, and, and kind of being in the office and getting used to that new that change of position and I, I, I completed my internship my uh, administrative internship last year so I have experience with the, with the the men in the office right now and I'm looking forward to continuing some of the great work that we have so thank you for having me yes we have not given Laura much of a break every day <laughs> we've got her building schedules and creating curriculum and I mean she's just been she's been taxed so we're keeping her very busy it's but been thank fun you, Laura. <laughs> thank you it's going to be wonderful to have you at the high school. It's great. So thank you. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have a new assistant principal at Hopkinton Middle School. Um, this is Chris Acampo, who comes to us from the Framingham Public Schools. He had formerly been working at the high school, but he will be joining our middle school. So Chris, you can tell us a little bit about uh, your journey to Hopkinton Middle School. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's, it's nice to finally see some faces um, in the Hopkinton community. Um, I am very excited to join Hopkinton. I feel like it's a, a fresh, uh, fresh breath of air for me. Uh, I've been in Framingham for about 10 years. Um, I started off as a paraprofessional, um, and then I became a teacher, um, and then I decided to go back to school and work on my administrator's license. And so um, I'm very blessed to be able to land in such a great school system. Um, one of the things that, uh, that came up in my interview is why Hopkinton? And I brought up the uh, um, idea of me growing up in a very similar town called Maynard. And uh, it was so strikingly similar. So landing in a place like this kind of feels like home for me. Um, I previously, while I was at Framingham, I was the director of the special education ESY program for a number of years. Uh, I was the team chair for the NIAS committee, um, and I was also the ultimate Frisbee coach for a number of years, um, and I helped found the program. Um, last year, I completed the Boston Marathon, so uh, Hopkinton holds a very special place in my heart, and I'm very excited to be a part of the community, so thank you. Thank you, too. And I, I know this may be a little bit off the beaten path, but I was part of the um, interview process, you know, at the very end for Chris. And Chris, I would just like for you to just very briefly tell everyone how it is that you became a paraprofessional, because I think that that's such a lovely part of your story. Sure. Um, so I, I, I graduated college with a business degree. And um, the reason I graduated with a business degree is because I just wanted to make money. I just, I knew that I wanted to make a ton of money and um, I just found myself not really wanting to sit in front of a computer all day and, and crunch numbers. And so uh, one of my good friends who actually was a paraprofessional at Framingham reached out to me and said, hey, there's a spot for you at the high school. Um, if you're willing to take it, I think you'd be great at it. Um, so I had no idea that I would fall into education. And once I did, I fell in love with it. Um, I sat in a number of classes, um, and I really observed all the teachers as I walked around with the student that I worked with. Um, 
And as the days go by, I, I learned from each teacher and I, I kind of stole a few things here and there from them. And then I decided to get my teaching license. Um, so it, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's really crazy for me to think about 10 years ago that I, I started off as someone that did, had no idea that I would land in education and then I completely fell in love with it. And now I'm here in front of you all and I just, I can't um, feel any more blessed. So thank you. Yeah, so Chris, thank you. And um, and I, I hope I didn't put you on the spot there, but I think that your story sort of speaks to the story of all of these candidates tonight. You, what you brought you know, in your interview processes and what we know you'll bring is not just you know, your intellect and in all of those wonderful things, but really your passion as well. So thank you for being here in Hopkinton and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. Yes, welcome. We're so excited to have you, and it's um, brave of you to step in during the turbulent times that we're facing. And if you're doing schedules, I'm sure you're then redoing schedules, and um, you'll be doing that again in iterations as we move forward. But um, we're so excited to have you, and um, excited to have you contribute to this to this district. So thank you so much. Anybody else have any comments? Just to echo a uh, welcome and a thank you for joining, uh, coming aboard right now, and how lucky we are to have attracted uh, such qualified people into, the, into our district. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll let you get back to your lives on this steamy night. <laughs> Bye, thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have public comment. Uh, Nancy, I don't know if you are the text number for the public comment for tonight. Oh, you keep moving around. I, sorry, I am the, oh my, sorry, my video, I hit by accident. I am the text number. I did not receive any uh, any comments at all. Okay, Dr. Kavanaugh, did you, did you receive any public comments? I do have one email, so I will read it. Um, this email comes to us from someone named Sangeetha Shankar. And what she asks is, um, please find my questions below. When the schools are reopening in September with a hybrid model, what will the contingency plan be in case the following happens? A child in a class is tested positive or if a child's parent is tested positive, how long will the classes school be suspended for? This is probably going to happen more than a few times during the school year. So during those times, we have to again switch to online learning model. This is going to be confusing for kids and extremely difficult for the parents to keep switching between working remotely and going to the office. What if the teacher or few teachers test positive and are away from class for weeks? Uh, again, I would assume the class would be suspended, and in this case, they couldn't even do online classes. How do you plan on making sure the lower elementary kids are wearing masks throughout the day and maintaining social distancing? If the teacher is trying to help them wear masks, she'll have to touch multiple kids, one after the other, and this is going to go against the social distancing rules. Also, it feels like the teacher would be spending the majority of the day making sure kids follow the rules rather than focusing on teaching. And finally, how are we going to take care of social distancing and mask rules in the school bus, especially with elementary kids? Kids are going to be kids and all handsy in the bus when no one is monitoring them. Given all of the above challenges, I personally feel continuing with online learning until earning early spring will be a safer and more durable model than a hybrid or a complete in-class model. And she thanks us. Um, and what the only thing that I would say to that is this evening, there will be a um, presentation made uh, regarding, you know, some of where we are in our, our in-district planning and some of the things that the commissioner has shared with the district. Okay, thank you. Okay, that brings us to reports. Um, Ms. Rathavik, I think we have a financial report coming up first. Yes. And Susan, are you able to take the screen? Yes, she can. Great. Okay. Um, so this is our end of year close. Um, and as we talked a little bit in the appropriations committee, there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, what has happened during the time of closure. Um, 
the money that was saved, and also uh, just kind of thinking more long-term in terms of covering revenue losses and also setting us up for the FY21 budget. So at this time, we are ending with a, um, a positive variance of around 85,000 that will go back to the town and that will go into their free cash for appropriation at, in, a, you know, in future years. So as you can see, um, payroll had a negative variance, but the expense side had a positive variance. And you can see the details below in terms of where all of those different changes came from. And again, we used some of the savings and moved some of our um, loss of revenue into the operating budget to keep those revolving funds so that they would be available for the FY21 budget and beyond. Um, so you can see some of the um, things such as preschool. So in the general fund, it had 129,000 um, negative variance, and that's because that was the amount of money we would have charged to that preschool revolving and we moved it back into the general fund, the operating budget, because we were not getting revenue and there's potential we'll get no revenue in FY21, depending on what the model of teaching is going to be. Um, so these were strategic moves that we did. Um, to not only close FY20, but put us in a good place for 21 and beyond. So again, you can see the detail behind the payroll variances, and then also the detail behind the expense variances. And then secondly, the second page of that financial report gives you the expense transfers that were done. So while you approve warrants, that give you the detail of where those charges, the account numbers are being charged. Um, because of what we did, we moved money differently than what the warrant was that you approved. So these are the expense transfers that happened. So you can see the preschool revolving, we moved 129,000 back into the operating budget. Uh, the international tuition fund, we moved 230,000. The parking fee revolving, we use that to cover crossing guards. So we moved that back into the fund. Um, the IDEA grant, we moved 28,000 of that grant back into the operating fund. And that gives us more flexibility for special education um, looking forward. Circuit breaker, same thing, 225,000. Building use revolving, this was the amount that we had charged to the building use. And as we know, with the building shutdown, of course, we did not have any building rentals. And that may also continue on into the future in FY21. And then food service, of course, with the loss of, loss of revenue, um, we moved that over as well. So the rest of the report uh, you have seen before, the third page, I believe this is now, these are the positions that were added during the year. Um, and then this was one of the positions that was reduced. So that's where your uh, total position net cost came from that is on the first page. Um, so I know this is new to both uh, Leah and um, I, I apologize. I, I don't think I said your name right. <laughs> And, and Joe, so I know this is uh, new for you. Um, first time seeing it in this format, but if anyone has any questions at this time, let me know. Does anyone have any questions? Comments, anything? No questions, but thank you for uh, spelling this all out for us. Any other questions or comments? Leah, I think it's Leah, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> and Leah and Joe, um, you know, welcome to the committee as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you spelling the pluses and minuses this way. It's helpful. 
Yes. And I don't have any comments, uh, questions either. I think you've um, been so clear in the last few meetings of in having us anticipate where these transfers are going to come from, and you've kind of been laying this out for a while. So um, I appreciate all the work you guys did, especially to do the best you can to cover um, anticipated one-time costs next year with any money we were able to um, apply from this year and, and so forth, and, and be creative with these transfers. I really, really appreciate it. I just had one, um, I did have one request for the next meeting. If you could give us a um, a balance of the HCA uh, money account. I, I don't think that we have um, any money currently that's been allocated by town meeting available to be spent, but if we could add it to the um, re financial report going forward, uh, just so we can keep track of anything that might have been allocated and not spent yet. Yeah, so maybe it's here and I missed it. Yeah, if you go to the page, um, let's see. So the the page that has uh, the revolving grants and uh, the revolving and the grant accounts, you'll see the HCA mitigation account. So five hundred thousand dollars was moved to be in our control, but that is what is being used for both the um, uh, the high school addition and and some some for the portables so while 500,000 was moved over to be spent by the school committee it is already allocated so there isn't anything beyond that that is available that is that is in our accounts so the 831,000 that was received is in a stabilization account which is not which is different than this this is an account that we can spend out of. The stabilization account um, requires town meeting. Correct. Yep. Yes. Great. So, thank you. I forgot this line item was here. So I just want to, that's great. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's it for the financial report. I think that brings us to the superintendent's report. Let me unshare. All right. Emily making people small. There we go. All right. Okay. It, are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 I'm not sure if your slide yes. is cut off though. Yeah, it is looking kind of funny over there. I'm not sure why it's like that. Okay. Let's see what it looks like if I go to the next slide. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Should we get Chris back on? I know. <laughs> Where did he go? All right, let's see. Let's see if I try this. I still cut. Oh, there we go. Okay, very good. All right. Um, so this is my superintendent re report for July 9th. And before I start, I, I was very remiss at the beginning of this. I think maybe I was so wrapped up in um, introducing our new school personnel that I do want to welcome you, Leah Rafferty, and you, Joe Markey. So thank you for... Um, <laughs> all that you will do on our school committee. I met with Leah yesterday and we were talking about just how much work this can be for people who are volunteering of their time. So um, thank you on behalf of the Hopkinton Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, and welcome. All right, so just a few things that are happening in our schools. Um, ESY extended school year started on Monday. And um, we are really excited that we are one of the few communities in the state that has that in-person hybrid model operating right now. And I am grateful to Dr. Zaleski, who um, is really kind of paving the way to see how this hybrid model will work. Uh, what you see in these pictures, I think, are, are pretty telling about the safety precautions that we have in place. So in the lower left, 
what you see are just small Play-Doh cans, but each one of those things is sitting on, um, or two of them are sitting on a plastic bag. And what we've learned from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is that there can be no sort of shared materials of that sort. So what they have done is they've just, you know, arranged them so that every child will have his or her own as they come into the classroom each day. The middle picture, you see something very similar. You know, each one of those tables has only one child who sits at it, and all of the materials for that child stay with that child during the day. Um, and then the last picture, and I'm not quite sure that you can see that um, because the sunshine is so bright there, but this uh, teacher over here on the right is standing on a pink X, and then several feet away, we have another teacher standing on a pink X. And so as the kids are kind of coming out of their cars, they are you know, just naturally socially distanced um, by where each one of the teachers are there in the morning, uh, welcoming them into the program. Um, our re-entry advisory group met on Tuesday night, so a couple of nights ago, and that is a huge group of people. I think that we are 36 people strong, and we are breaking ourselves into um, these sort of smaller uh, subcommittees and doing work in those, um, in those spaces and then bringing back all of the work, sort of, so to speak, to the larger group. Today, we had a Commissioner Riley meeting. And the commissioner shared a few things with us. Um, and I will actually walk you through all of those things, even though we'll be talking about um, COVID reentry in just a moment. But I think it's important to say these things. And maybe this is um, sort of what made the person who sent in her public comment um, get a little bit nervous because people really don't know where we are. Um, the commissioner wants people in Massachusetts to know that we are in a better place than most states in the country to open our schools. And he himself has placed a priority on in-person school, in-person and full-time. What he told superintendents today was that if you are not opening your school in-person and full-time, he wants to know what the obstacles are to that. Um, and at this time, he really does not know of a single district that is doing all remote instruction. Um, but that said, if there are families who would choose to have remote instruction, that will be an option for them. Um, each superintendent across the Commonwealth has to write a three scenario plan. And when you do that, you have to talk about what it would look like if you have full time um, in brick and mortar instruction or hybrid instruction. So part time in brick and mortar, part time outside of school, or if you're going with entirely remote. And I think one of the advantages to having those three plans is that you can kind of turn on a dime. So say, for example, you do full in brick and mortar, everyone is there all day long, and then suddenly we all have to go out on remote instruction. You know, those, those plans are all in place so that you can do that pretty much overnight. The special education guidance came out today. Um, he is going to send us a plan template. So every district will fill out a template so that there's sort of a um, consistent reporting form that goes back to DESE. The commissioner is encouraging districts to wait until early August to complete their final plans. This might be the most important bullet in this presentation. So why is that so important? I am certain that there are families at home, and I absolutely understand this and empathize with it, who are trying to make plans for the fall. You know, you have two working parents who's going to take care of the kids in the event that we are remote or hybrid. Um, and I know how difficult it is for families to make these, these plans, but the commissioner has suggested that we wait until early August just because he wants to have all of the data from the medical side and about the trajectory of the virus. Um, he will be sending us start stop protocols. So when the person asks those questions in public comment tonight, what's going to happen if someone um, contracts COVID-19, if someone has to be quarantined, what will, what will that look like? And so we will get all of those protocols handed to us from DESE. Our transportation, um, in district as well as at the state level, it's all still in process. As of today, the rule was still three feet of distancing. And if it's three feet of distancing in our buses, um, that fills the buses to about only one third capacity and buses may in that situation have to do double runs. So for those of you who are in appropriations earlier, one of the questions was, you know, will you be incurring more costs? And um, and that that's a potential cost, although, you know, 
it's hard to imagine if you know you'd you'd incur much more costs than um, just sort of fuel costs, right? Um, the commissioner will work with the governor to establish COVID-19 testing protocols in the event that we are choosing or they are choosing to have the adults in our schools tested. Uh, medical professionals are still debating and determining what will happen with classes like chorus, band, uh, physical education. The commissioner is still considering altering the school year, changing the number of required days from 180 to 177. So if he changes those numbers, what will actually happen is the students will attend 177, but the teacher will, teachers would still work to their number of contracted days. So we would be able to have you know, five maybe days at the start of the school year to do all kinds of training uh, with the teachers so that when we push out remote learning, if we have to in a remote or a hybrid model, we will really be maximizing uh, what that looks like. Or if we're on a reduced day, how do we maximize our instructional time and deliver the best sort of independent work to students that we can? Um, I think I've already said that if parents choose not to send their kids, we will certainly have some kind of an educational plan for those families. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is working on getting us a learning management system. So if families do choose to be remote, uh, you know, that would be a means of pushing out education to those families. Uh, even with plexiglass dividers in certain settings, we still have to have the three feet of distance. So I know a lot of people are thinking, well, with a max mask and plexiglass, does that reduce the three foot requirement? And the answer today was no. And um, the medical community prefers a week to week model. So kids would be in for a week and then out for B week. Um, but from a teaching and learning stance, uh, the teaching and learning community prefers an every other day model. Um, and obviously every other day model has more continuity for kids and learning and there's less learning loss during the time period that you would be out, which is about nine days if you do a week on a week off. Um, moving right along to a totally different topic, um, we have been in the schools contacted by a community member who is thinking about establishing a Hopkinton Freedom Team. Um, that person is Kathleen Dinsmore. Uh, she describes herself as a person who's a civil rights attorney and someone who is also an immigration attorney. She's going to have a first meeting next Wednesday on July 15th and has invited some of the people who are employees in town. Um, and I believe that she'll be inviting board members, um, students, clergy, and eventually anyone in the community is welcome to be a part of this Hopkinton Freedom Team, which I'm assuming will have all kinds of activities, but also be an attestation to um, the fact that we believe in um, a socially just and anti-racist community. And switching gears again, we have our construction projects. So on the left-hand side, you can see some photographs that were taken from behind the Elmwood School. Um, what you see um, in those concrete sauna tubes at the, at the bottom there on the left-hand side, so they have poured those for the foundation at Elmwood. And at the Hopkins School, you get a nice aerial view there as well as uh, one from the ground. So in both places, everything is fenced off and the work is underway. Here we have an enrollment update. And uh, for those of you new to the committee, you'll see these um, with some frequent regularity, I guess. Almost every meeting we'll be looking at enrollment. Uh, what you can see in this is uh, where the 1920 enrollment was. So for example, in grade one, we had 270 students. We have approved two students. So we are definitely at 272. Uh, pending approval are nine students, but we have had six students exit that grade. So currently we are thinking that first grade, for example, would be at about 275. And I always uh, warn people not to get too comfortable with those numbers at this time of year, because what typically happens, and had you been in the appropriations meeting, um, you know that 
we just heard that the Hopkinton housing market, you know, uh, is very hot. You know, there's a lot of houses that are on the market and a lot of houses that are are closing. So, you know, clearly uh, people are moving in. We don't know if the people buying those homes are people who have um, children who are school aged. But what typically happens every year is that in that period sort of between August 1st and August 15th, things really heat up with enrollment. So I think you'll notice these numbers kind of growing incrementally in the next couple of weeks. And then that's very likely to be kind of a, a big spike. If you think about where uh, it was projected that when we did our, um, capacity study, and we had um, someone come in and take a look at enrollment uh, projections. Um, places like Elmwood and Hopkins right now are about 30 students off the projections. So if 30 students enter those two buildings, each building, uh, between now and the start of school, we will be at the capacity for the 21 school year. And you know kids will trickle in all year long. So 30 is kind of the place for those two, two particular buildings. Um, just some good MCAS news. Uh, there was no spring MCAS. And so if we had seniors in our building who needed to earn a competency determination, so say, for example, you moved to Hopkinton in November from out of state, you would not have had an opportunity to take the MCAS test and you would not have had an opportunity then to get a competency determination. And then you would not have an opportunity even with all of the credits in, you know, stellar grades to um, get a diploma in Massachusetts. So what Desi did was say, if you were a senior who needed to earn a competency determination, you could prove that this year with coursework. And so all of our seniors who needed to do that have done so. So no one will be left behind because of not administering an MCAS test this year. And I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I will stop my screen share. Any questions or comments for Dr. Kavanaugh? Not at this time, thank you. Nope, thank you. Great. Leah Thanks or Joe? Know. Yeah, thank you. I uh, have a lot to digest from that. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Sure. Okay, and I don't, believe that I have any questions either. So looks good. Um, I think we're moving on to the school committee chair report. I find myself now sitting in that chair. So I will um, just briefly say uh, thank you to Nancy for the nomination, which I wasn't expecting. And um, it was very kind, I think, but we'll be talking. Um, and I wanted to welcome Joe and Leah to the committee. Um, I'm so excited to have both of you. and. We have obviously a lot to consider in the coming year, so it'll be great to have you on board. So welcome. And Thank I will... you, Amanda. I would be careful. It's not, I don't know if it's kind to be put. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <Goodbye>. <laughs> yes, I'm well aware. This is a service role. This does all the administrative service for the committee. Well aware of that. So. That's right. But you know, I, I I have seen you advocate strongly for the schools, and I hope that this puts you in a position to represent us uh, with a strong voice. Thank you. I hope so too. And um, Nancy, since you have been acting chair in Mina's absence, I wonder if you have a chair report. I, other than, do you want me to read the warrants that I approved? I, so I approved warrants 20-062, 20-063, 20-064, and 20-065, and they are all included in the packet. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for serving as interim chair. And thank you to Mina, from whom I learned quite a bit um, during this past year for also serving as our chair. Um, I really appreciated her, her guidance. So with that, we move on to liaison reports. Does anyone have a liaison report? I do not. Nada. Um, I can only report on behalf of Hop Coalition that they held a very successful drive-in movie night um, that was happily attended by many residents at the middle school parking lot. Um, people seem so excited to get out of um, their houses and do something social. Everybody had masks. They stayed by their cars. It was very successful. The police department was huge in making this happen, and Chief Bennett was um, wonderful in getting us police support. He welcomed everybody, and it was a big success for the Hop Coalition. So 
I want to thank them for that. That was awesome. I, I was not there, but I saw a lot of people commenting on Facebook. Okay, moving right along. We're so efficient tonight. Um, office hours is on our agenda. We have been slipping in our office hours and it's hard to hold office hours. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on holding office hours during the summer as, as so much is going on in the district? Do we want to set anything up, a Zoom, Zoom office hour, is it like? I, I think at this point, it would be advisable. We haven't done it in a while because I think all of our heads have been spinning um, with the amount of information coming at us and the uncertainty is looming large. But I think it would benefit everybody just to offer some of those um, maybe next week. I'm wondering, you know, with so much going on, do we want to try to have a standing um, between now and the start of school, maybe a standing like every Friday we rotate responsibility for even an hour, um, something like that, that we give people an opportunity to raise their comments and questions. Are, any, are people around and willing to staff office hours? Amanda, on, on to clarify, Friday, are, are, are office hours uh, going to be in a place or is this a Zoom meeting? I think right now it would be Zoom. It would be virtual. And then Friday. And so, typically what we do, sorry, is we have two people, um, obviously to avoid a quorum, we have two people staff per hour and residents can come and um, ask our questions. Often it's, there are questions that are very operational and we can redirect to whomever in the school district um, can answer the questions. But in this case, there may be a lot of questions about reopening, a lot of concerns, many of which are being voiced, hopefully directly to the reopening advisory committee, but we can also help be a voice for that. So I certainly can be available um, to staff Zoom office hours on a regular basis. Sure, I can too. I like that, but I wonder if we want to offer some evenings and some days just because I know based on people's you know working situations and whatnot they may be able to do one and not the other yeah I agree with that do you like do you think days are good or like breakfast is it morning you know sure. early morning or midday what do you think would work for people I don't know what would work but work for people like on a regular basis but I know the like a morning or midday might be difficult if that was all we offered if we did earlier midday one week and then the following week did an evening time I think either early or midday would be fine if we also offer an evening time some weeks okay we have general consensus on the idea so I, what I'll do is put together a schedule that alternates I think that's a really good idea um, and see if we can get signups from each of us, we have two for each uh, Zoom, if that works. So I can follow up offline. Great. Great. Okay. That moves us on to new business. We have policy JF, school admissions and residency requirements. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, the policy working group, and at the time, uh, Jen Devlin was still with us in this in this working group, we reviewed this on June 22nd, and we reviewed it because uh, we are moving into, you know, that season where people are starting to register children for the Hopkinton Public Schools. Uh, one of the very simple changes that we made to this document was to include um, all of the civil rights language, race, color, religion, national origin, because that is constantly being updated, and we realized that it hadn't been updated in this particular policy. Uh, but there were a few things that we had kind of run into um, questions with last summer when we were doing residency. And so one of the important uh, pieces that we took out of this document was a notarized att attestation of residency. Um, and we did add things in there, such as um, a property deed or a fully executed lease. Um, and I think before it would have just said a copy of a lease, but this one is a, now says a fully executed lease. 
Um, we did also add the language that um, if you're moving to Hopkinton after 30 days from the start of the school year, because this has often been a question, you know, folks will call the schools and say, I'll be closing on my house on November 15th, and then that would exceed 30 school days from the start of the school year. So we just want to be very clear with people that, you know, 30 days from the start of the school year is 30 days from the start of the school year. So putting it into this policy kind of made sense to us. Um, and then in the event that we are, you know, questioning if a person is a resident of Hopkinton, um, you know, the Hopkinton Public Schools, like all other schools in Massachusetts, do um, investigations to ensure that students who are enrolled here, um, in, in the event that any of those factors uh, arise, so, you know, we send mail to a home and the mail gets returned, um, we just make sure that um, the family is still living in that particular residence in Hopkinton. So those are the things that we are thinking about changing, and I know that this is a, a first reading of this policy. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Does anyone have any thoughts on the draft? I do, Amanda. Um, I wonder if uh, Dr. Kavanaugh could provide a little more context on some of the experiences or learnings over the past year. I mean, as a public school district, I want to make sure we get the message out that we're inclusive. But I'm guessing there's been some incidents or occasions that uh, gave, gave rise to some of these suggested you know, revisions. Yes. So, I mean, the last part of that, obviously, the part um, where we talk about um, investigations, you know, there have been some families who had been living in Hopkinton, and then, you know, they may move to a neighboring district um, and continue to have students who are enrolled in the Hopkinton public schools. And, you know, the residence requirements are really around, you know, where a child resides and essentially where, you know, he or she puts his head on a pillow at night, right? But some of the other things in there, you know, the fully executed lease, sometimes people would come with a lease that they were about to sign and they would say, well, your language doesn't say that, you know? So a lot of it was just really just tightening up language. I actually uh, very much appreciate this. I was a November 15th type person and uh, I had a lot of, no, I had a lot of back and forth that was very confusing with the staff when we were moving or with different people telling me different things. So I appreciate the wording being clarified so that everyone knows exactly where things stand. Um, so thank you. That's, I think that's a good thing. Thank you. Do you mind if I just mention one word? Oh, no, not at all. Um, in the list, in that kind of second chunk in red, could we change disability to ability? I will check on that one, Meg, for you. Uh, for me personally, I don't have take issue with it, but that language is pretty much, you know, that kind of legislative boilerplate kind of language that goes into all of these. And our attorneys tell us that these that this is the language required sort of by the state. But I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments at this time? I, I feel um, because it is the summer, because people are very distracted in particular, we've, I don't think we received any feedback on the draft that went out, but I do think we need to give this some cycles. This is the first reading. Um, but in the interim, um, Nancy, did you have any questions on it at all? No. No, thank you. So I think we just hold it for now and we um, we send it out again for a second reading and as people come back and forth from vacation and, and whatnot, hopefully the community will have a chance to look at it and please provide feedback if you see anything that um, you wanna raise a question on. That sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. So I think we are moving on to the school opening report. Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure. All right. Once again, I will take the screen. Oh, that's great. It worked this time. All right, so I will just share a few of the slides that um, I had presented also to the reentry advisory group the other night. 
Uh, if you are wondering who the people are on that group, all 36 members of them, uh, I won't read all the names, but you can see that we have our five building principals, the teachers association president and the paraprofessional president. Uh, we have several teachers from each of our buildings. We've got um, a bunch of parents on this. We've got the director of public health in Hopkinton. We've got um, the head nurse, Kathy Bain for the, for the public schools. And as kind of in that alternate, these are folks down in the gray that you know we know have to contribute to the work, but don't really need to attend all of the 36 member meeting, uh, student services, technology, and the one of the assistant principals at the middle school. Um, so you can see we are very well stocked in, in this group, uh, elected officials, someone from the select board and someone from the school committee, so. Uh, the whole role of this advisory group is to make recommendations to the superintendent what, as to what school and its ancillary functions are going to look like in Hopkinton in September of 2020. Uh, one of the things that we know is that despite all of the guidance that has come out from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, uh, there seems to be this feeling that districts are really allowed to make decisions for themselves. And so I am hoping that uh, when we put our best minds together, what we come up with is something that is just right for Hopkinton. Um, ultimately, the, the group is an advisory group and the decisions um, around opening are going to uh, really fall to the superintendent and to the central office team. But of course, we will keep people apprised of all of the work that we are doing along the way. Uh, what are we asking the reentry group members to do? Um, they will be reviewing what curriculum and instruction sort of looked like last spring. Uh, we can, I mean, obviously they can't alter the Hopkinton Public Schools curricula in any way, but certainly they are able to suggest ways to maximize its delivery. We had sent a very long survey out to parents and we got a lot of good feedback there, but I think it's really important to hear the voices of people who are telling us, you know, we are two working parents and my children can't do remote instruction. It's just not possible. Or, you know, as a single parent, it's really hard for me to monitor my four children, you know, accessing remote instruction every day. Um, and it, at, at the time that we went into that meeting, it really felt like the commissioner, with, commissioner of education was favoring a hybrid model. It seemed like he was really pushing districts to go in that direction. But in today's meeting, he really did a 180 and it looks like he wants people to go back to school full time. So we're going to do what is right for Hopkinton. We will create that three pronged approach so that we have the three scenarios, hybrid, remote, and in brick and mortar. And we will really make decisions that are um, based on the resources that we have in front of us, the health and safety of all of our kids, um, and what we believe is the best kind of instruction for students given these um, parameters. Uh, they'll be looking at transportation services. And again, we are still waiting for guidance from the department. They'll be taking a look at how to best deliver food service. And what we heard today from the commissioner is that he wants students eating in the classroom. He does not want movement around the building, especially when it comes to food service. Um, and he is maintaining that six foot requirement anytime kids masks are off so that they are eating. Now, if we have our classrooms set up so that they are only three feet distance, some of our kids will be eating in the classroom and some will have to um, report to some other socially six foot distanced um, setting. We will be talking a lot about daily schedules. And obviously if we, you go back full time, you'd have a typical schedule, but in the event that you are on a day off a day or you have a reduced schedule, those things are um, certainly going to impact teaching and learning. What will happen if we are told that we can't have chorus classes Will they just become academic or at the high school, for example, would you have all of your band instruction remote? Those are things that we're going to be talking about at length. Uh, our high need students are planning to come into school every single day, which I think makes a whole lot of sense. And um, at each building, the minimum requirement is three feet with masks and masks are according to the commissioner, guidelines for grade two and up. Um, someone did ask the commissioner today if individual dist districts could increase those three foot requirements. The answer is yes in classrooms. And could we uh, require students in K and one to wear masks 
And obviously uh, the answer to that is yes, we can ask them to wear masks. And if students are sort of physically and um, kind of emotionally able to do that, that just increases the safety for all. All right, what do we know and what don't we know? Right now we really have 30,000 foot guidance. We still have no guidelines for transportation and food service is also in kind of a uh, tentative place. We will be getting additional guidance in pieces. So for example, today we got the special education guidance. We'll be getting templates. We'll be getting transportation guidance as, as they are prepared. Uh, one of the primary goals is really to limit movement and reduce physical proximity, which I feel like is a whole lot easier when you are talking about kids in K-8. to At the high school level, we did some analysis and certainly less than 50% of our kids would ever have the same schedule. And so our students are really going to have to have movement at the high school level. We will be keeping our, if you are keeping your schools closed, that comes with great economic, societal and mental health costs. I can't tell you how many parents have emailed me to say, you know, physical health might be compromised if kids are in school, but I'm telling you that kids' mental health is further compromised out of school. So that's one philosophy that's out there. And districts and schools will be submitting our comprehensive plans um, sometime in August. What you see on the screen right now are the sort of subcommittees. We've divided them into curricular subcommittees, health conditions to transportation. Um, someone will be coming up with an MOU with the HTA and obviously there are other bargaining units that might be impacted. So maybe we will have to do the same with the paraprofessionals. Maybe we'd have to do the same with the custodians, for example. And then finally, we have three subcommittees who will be looking at building schedules at the elementary, middle and high school levels. Uh, these are just the things that we sort of already have in place, uh, wearing masks, uh, regular hand washing and physical distancing. I won't go through all of those because I am sure that you have heard them all hundreds of times. Uh, these photographs are kind of interesting. What you see in the picture here are middle school desks. These are uh, 19 desks with seven feet of separation. And I believe those seven feet are, they are measured from edge of chair to edge of chair. Here are 24 desks with five feet of separation. And uh, when this came up, you know, someone was looking at these pictures in our meeting and they said, that doesn't really look like five feet. And the truth of the matter is that they're probably about four feet, eight inches. Um, but that certainly meets the criteria uh, handed down from the state. One thing that you're going to see in this picture, and I think that this is interesting, if you look at the back left wall of this teacher's classroom and then the entire back wall of the classroom, you can see that there's a table, a cafe set, some blue plastic chairs, a bookcase, a file cabinet. And what the commissioner has suggested is all of that stuff needs to leave teachers' classrooms. He wants nothing more in there but a teacher's desk and children's desks. So as we look at some of the COVID money, we do not have enough space in our public schools to store those materials. So we may actually be renting storage facilities if it comes to that. Um, in the event that we brought every single student back and we did need to put 24 students in this classroom, you would be able to separate kids out further if you eliminated um, those tables and chairs back there. This is a Hopkins picture, 24 desks with three feet of separation. I was in this model classroom today. These model classrooms have been set up throughout the district. This is also an interesting slide. We have a dashboard that was sent to us um, through DESI. All you do is you plug in the number of students that you want to put in that classroom and you plug in um, the square footage of the classroom. And, um, you know, obviously they'll tell you that the locations of doorways or fixed furniture or whiteboards, those kinds of things might impact the layout of these classrooms. But this is one at Hopkins. And using this layout right here and using a triangular model uh, will get us 24 desks in this room. And those are all four feet apart. And when you take a look at the 24 desks that are in this room, say for example, this room only really needed to have 22 students in it, 
you could eliminate these two student desks and the teacher desk could very readily go right in this position right here. But we are messing around honestly with almost every classroom in the district to ensure that we can get kids in there safely. You know, the primary model is to put in the, the requisite number of desks. That does not mean that we are committed to that model. Um, we are also looking at setting up classrooms that have a hybrid model. So some of them right now have 15 chairs in there. And then say, for example, a kidney table with plexiglass set up to do something like small group instruction or guided reading. And finally, this is a um, marathon classroom and uh, it's 832 square feet. And what we have this set up for is 30 seats. And so if you had removed two teacher desks, two student desks to put in the teacher, you really have a 28 student capacity. So this is the work that's going on. And I'm telling you the amount of work to do this kind of analysis of you know, literally acres and acres of classrooms is just very, very taxing. Um, just some healthy policies. We will be reducing parents and visitors in our classrooms this year. I know that this will be very difficult to parents in the beginning. Parents frequently come and go. They're mystery readers. They're dropping off lunches. They're dropping off guitars, all of those kinds of things. Um, that would, you know, geometry books, those kinds of things would, you know, probably have to cease for next year. Uh, a sickness protocol will come out, uh, a very formal one from the department, and we will be sort of retraining everybody in communication, just reinforcing those healthy practices that have to happen uh, throughout the day, and that includes things like appropriate signage. Healthy schedules, minimizing transition times, uh, or even minimizing transitions themselves. Uh, lunchtime, just keeping kids in classrooms with six feet of distance, disinfecting surfaces between lunches, no sharing of lunches, and um, with transportation, again, still awaiting guidance. We met on the 7th. We'll be meeting again as a whole group on the 21st. In between that time and the two-week period, we certainly have um, subcommittee meetings put together. And hopefully when we get back together on the 21st, we have some very solid plans in place. And then hopefully August 4th, uh, we will have something in writing that can be shared with uh, families. In the event that we get some feedback from families, we might bring our group back together on the 18th of August, uh, but we'll sort of see where we end up. And that is the update on what the reentry group is doing and what we are doing as well as a school community to prepare. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. That's obviously a lot to digest and think about. And all you have done is really mostly present the questions. So yeah. and thinking about the answers is a completely different issue. But um, do committee members have questions at this time for Dr. Kavanaugh? No, but it, I, I just want to acknowledge and recognize how many variables we're looking at and how complicated it is. And um, it, it feels like we're pressed for time a little bit, but I know that this will yield fruitful work in the end. So thank you. Yes, well, it might feel that we are pressed for time. I, I would venture to say after being on several calls today that we're in maybe better shape than many districts. And I will also say that of the 30 or 40 superintendents on that call, no one had the same plan. So. Fascinating, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, we're all building the airplane in flight. Any other comments or questions? No. I just wanna say, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Kavanaugh. Uh, from everything there, there's a lot of work going on, and I saw her name in many of the subcommittees and subgroups, so uh, everyone's putting in a lot of effort, and it's really appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I'm grateful for all the people who are putting in the time. Joe? Looks like a, a good working group and a, a good plan, so good luck. We'll look for an update at the next meeting. Yeah, I, I just want to also echo the thanks. I mean, I saw a lot of teachers who should be on summer vacation who are coming in, a lot of parents who are um, 
committing, you know, a lot of time to this effort uh, of their own time. And I just really appreciate that generosity and the commitment to the district. And that's, you know, what we love about our district, but I know it takes a huge toll on families and teachers and staff. And I really appreciate the work that um, they're doing and the parents are doing to, to bring their uh, perspectives forward. And Meg, who's serving for us. Excellent. And students. And students as well. Yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to, I guess maybe for the community. So what, when I think about this, um, people say we like you to be back full time. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm hearing, what I'm understanding is that given the capacity of our buildings and the furniture that we have and the number of students that we have and the current status of the virus and the guidelines, it is pretty impossible for us to bring everybody in um, and keep them six feet apart every day of the week, all at once. I mean, do we have room for 4,000 students in our current building six feet apart, let alone forgetting transportation? But given the current guidance, could everybody be on campus without investing in you know, a heated tent, classroom, or you know, something crazy? So I would say that as we are looking at these classrooms, if you were able to isolate students to classrooms and you were using the three feet of guidance, you could probably do that with every student in a mask. But I think the confusion is going to come about when, for example, you have to stagger entry times because you can't ask 1,200 kids at Hopkinton High School to all walk through the front door like they typically would, you know, at, right. at the same time. So then do you have to create entrances and exits for freshmen and sophomore and juniors and seniors? And if you were to stagger the entry time, so freshmen arrived five minutes before sophomores, before juniors, before seniors, now you've got an awful lot of time that is just given to all of that, I guess, kind of transitioning. And lunch, I would also say it's going to be a, a huge ordeal because you really can't have you know, in those drawings that I just showed you where you were able to put 24 students or 20 students or 19 students, you're not going to get to, you would be getting to that six foot place in very few of our classrooms. So we would have to think hard about how we take kids out of them and put them all into the athletic center or the library or a school cafeteria. And then you get to the place of, you know, kind of who's monitoring lunch and because you're creating more spaces, you need more people to monitor. So there are a lot of logistical problems with full on, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it couldn't be done. It would just cost, I think, money and resources. Okay, so even in Elmwood and Hopkins, where we know through our enrollment growth, those buildings with their, the building, the classrooms and the special um, services spaces for EL and so forth, those have been tight. And we were adding these additional modulars, which is great, but we still think that we could potentially accommodate so far, depending on what August yields for new enrollments. Well, I think the other thing that you said um, that is important to note is forget about transportation. So <laughs> if we were thinking about transportation, I don't think we could ever get the Elmwood and, you know, Susan, you're here. You could certainly speak to this better than I could, but I don't think you could get the Elmwood marathon students into those buses and reduce that capacity to one third. So you would really be talking about increasing the number of bus routes. And then as you increase bus routes, you have later start times in some places. So you have later end times in other places, if you were to have a six and a half hour day. Otherwise, you'd be reducing the day, and then you'd be back to a hybrid model. Can I ask a question, Amanda, if that's okay? Um, sure. Just back, going back to the appropriations meeting earlier, there we had a conversation about the desks that I, it was at least at Marathon School, and that we would need to purchase those because it doesn't, they don't meet the current model of how we're doing things. I, my for immediate thought was, is there going to be a rush uh, for people to be buying desks as, as there kind of has been for different things throughout all of this? And at what point do we need to make a decision that yes, we need to purchase you know 300 desks or however many desks it is for those grades? I guess it would be more like 600 if it was marathon. So we've done this crazy inventory 
And in the event that we went with a hybrid model, so you only had 50% of your kids, at this point in time, Hopkins has enough desks to accommodate 50% of the population. Elmwood has quite a few desks over there. So what we would do is we would mark all of those desks as belonging to Elmwood, put them in trucks and drive them to Marathon and set those classrooms up so that you had your six feet of space and you could actually have enough desk and table space in all of the classrooms at Marathon, Elmwood, and Hopkins to make it work with the hybrid if you had only 50%. If you went to 100%, you would absolutely positively have to be buying desks. When would we need to do that by though? I, I guess I, I'm in my head thinking the decision doesn't seem like it's gonna be made for a few weeks out, which then there's a few more weeks after that when school starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the answer to that might be like yesterday. I, you know, I don't know I mean, if Tim Person were here, I would feel better about giving you an answer to that question, but I really don't know what the availability is. I apologize. It popped into my head between appropriations and now, otherwise I would have sent it to you in advance. It's okay. Amanda, may I ask a question? Oh, Sorry. sure. Go ahead, Leah. Um, so I, I, I think uh, Dr. Kavanaugh and I talked a little bit yesterday, like she said, um, and I think there's something that that was brought up that I, I would like to ask about because I think her her perception on this was really interesting to me, which is um, there's the mental health issue of kids not going to school, but then what happens when kids are stuck in the same room for hours and hours and hours on end? Um, and are, are we looking into that and, and what is the concern there? Yeah, so, you know, if you do have a, that six and a half hour day and we're bringing kids in and minimizing the movement, I mean, we have to find places where kids will be able to get up and go take a mask break somewhere or, you know, I mean, they can't sit in that particular classroom all day long. Um, one of the models that we have been looking at um, so you would have to probably push in music and it obviously could be a singing form, of course. It would have to be a more academic form, of course. Um, you'd have to push in art. But when it comes to things like, you know, PE, you know, on nice days, we could get the kids outside maybe for PE. Um, if we look at the sizes of our gyms and think that really you'd be reducing the number of kids there to half, I mean, you could probably get kids into into the gym for some PE. Uh, but, you know, at, at this point in time, it really would be very tricky, I think, to have our kids kind of, you know, in that same room with the same four walls and all day long. Thank you. Um, I just want to add one thing. Um, I don't want to repeat anything we said the other night at the advisory group. But I've been reading around different district plans mm. um, or drafts of plans. What I found interesting is that a couple of them are investing in tents so they can ensure that kids have outside time or they use some of the outside spaces. And we have so many beautiful outside spaces as part of our property. And I wonder if that's just something that we're considering already. We have not talked about tents, um, but I, I don't dislike the idea. I mean, if we could get kids outside, even, you know, even for like music class, if we went outside during a special, I would be perfectly happy to see kids outside under a tent, um, just so that they're in a change of venue with fresh air. Right, because you know the enormous tent setup we do on Marathon Day? Mm -hmm. Why can't we just keep that up for nine months? and ensure that the kids have time to go out. I think we'd probably have to buy and not rent that tent. <laughs> True. Dr. Hammer, just one other question I had about, I know we were very proactive at getting face shields. And um, I was wondering, I, what I haven't heard is the effectiveness or uh, is anyone approved face shields versus masks or is it in conjunction with a mask? And is there any like science behind the face shield? So what we, and, you know, obviously I, I never like to have, you know, try to pretend that I'm a, an authority on something that I, I would feel better if Sean McAuliffe from DPH was answering or that the commissioner had answered because he had information from uh, medical doctors. But 
what we are hearing is that students should be wearing masks, you know, and that the face shield is not really a substitute for a mask. What I have heard is that the mask prevents stuff from coming out and a shield will prevent stuff from coming in. So if you're wearing the shield, it doesn't prevent things, you know, it doesn't protect the people around you from, you know, any of the aerosol or droplets coming out of your mouth or nose. Um, I would guess that if you had both of those things, you know, you would be better protected, but that is certainly information that I would prefer that someone like Sean share with our group. Well, thank you so much for the report. I assume we'll be hearing more of the report next time. Um, and uh, apropos of the public comment, if the community has any questions or comments, what should they do with those other than email school committee, but should they, is there a way to email the advisory committee? Is there an email for the committee? Oh, sure. Any, if anyone is interested in emailing anything to the committee, just email it to me and I will ensure that it gets to the right subcommittee. And you know, before we leave this topic, I do want to say thank you to Jen Parson and Susan Rothermick. They are both sort of chairing um, several of those subcommittees as well. So they are out straight. So. Amanda, can we ask um, the superintendent, if there's anything she needs from us, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with the plan and I'm sure we all have a lot of questions and I bet they're the same questions that that group is going to be working through. Um, and I like the idea that the state is requiring kind of a three pronged plan. We'd be prepared in all three. And also I like that they're kind of pushing towards fall. But if you don't choose fall, explain why. Um, but what else do you need from us? I mean, we don't want to get into the same things that you're working on with the task group, but is there anything we can do? Yeah. I mean, the only thing that comes to mind immediately is, you know, having office hours would be really nice because, you know, there are some people who, you know, you know, they're obviously not in our, our sessions when we're having the reentry advisory and maybe they're not watching school committee tonight or they are watching school committee tonight and we've just generated 15 questions for them. So that, you know, that would be really nice if, if they had somewhere else to kind of go for more information or to ask questions. Thanks. If I'm not mistaken, you, you've put this information on the school website as well? Yes. yes. So I encourage people to check that out if you want to look through the slides again. But yeah. Joe, that's a, that's a good question. I think that there are a few more slides um, in the original presentation. Okay. This was the streamlined version. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> you can imagine those poor people who signed up for the committee. Well, Meg is still smiling, so that's good. So we will um, move along. As Dr. Kavanaugh, you haven't had enough work tonight. We're going to move along to your goals, your draft of your goals for fiscal year 21. OK, I'll just talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll, I'll just grab that screen one more time and just talk a little bit about the process. All right, so realistically, um, if you take a look at this second slide right here, the process for the superintendent to do uh, her goals and to actually work through the entire school year starts in the late spring summer so that's sort of where we are right now and you go through a process of self-assessment and you take a look at any student learning data and you go through the superintendent's rubric and you look at your evaluation from last year and then you start to formulate what you might think you want to work on um, throughout the year and as you can see from this second block down here uh, the you know you start to present your your proposed goals publicly. So what um, what we talked about doing tonight is really just to kind of introduce this process and let you know where I am in the process right now. And you know we thought about that because in past years you know we've been further along in this process, but uh, given the fact that we went out on uh, you know remote learning as long ago as uh, 
March 10th, you know, that has really put the district a little bit behind in thinking about, well, what are our school improvement plans going to look like? What does the district improvement plan look like? And so, um, you know, realistically, you know, the goals for the superintendent don't usually get approved until August anyway, but I just thought it might be nice to kind of put that out there tonight and give you a little taste of the kinds of things I'm thinking about. Um, just in terms of self-assessment, and these are really broad brush strokes, um, some of the district perceived needs uh, two years ago, when I started in this position, I wanted to do some work around diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, and anti-racism. And at the time, I know people kept saying, oh, you've got to go a little bit faster. We've got to get this work done. And I thought we do have to get the work done, but we've, we've moved slowly. And at this point in time, I feel like we're in a better place than we perhaps ever have been. Um, because now we're going from just the administrative team, you know, at that 30,000 foot level, having these kinds of conversations and we're moving into, you know, teachers and professional training and students and courses and thinking about text. So we're really getting uh, way more, uh, I guess, into the institution with, um, with the work. And the second thing I, we all know we need to do is to really create safe, high quality teaching and learning in the era of COVID. And maybe the way I have drafted the goal doesn't do it justice, but you know, I think our, our schools did a really nice job when we left for remote instruction in March. And at first it was, let's, start, let's prevent regression. And then by April 6th, it was full on you know, synchronous learning every day. And I am extremely proud of what our you know, curriculum people have been able to do, our technology people have been able to do, all of our teachers, parents, building principals. You know, we turned on a dime and made some really good instruction come out of the Hopkinton Public Schools. But that said, given the tentative nature of things and, you know, all of the things we just talked about, I think it's really important that we think about the ways in which we can really maximize instruction in either a hybrid or a remote model. One of the things that we are hearing from people who are you know, sort of medical professionals, virologists, um, is that you know, we could very readily be back out of school again, um, given you know, what we know about the, the virus. I tell people all the time, the virus has not changed. What has changed is human behavior. And so um, if things uh, turn again, we may be out of school. And then areas for professional growth. Um, I do want to continue to kind of grow my voice in the community, develop relationships with town partners and families, and continue to find additional outlets to convey with transparency, transparency information about our schools. And that's everything from, you know, what are we doing um, with a particular course curriculum or what are we doing with the budget? So this is really high level at this point. Uh, my tentative goals, I only have three of them right now. Typically what will happen is a superintendent will have somewhere around four to five of them, and they are in areas of district improvement, professional practice, and student achievement. Um, these three that I have right now are district improvement and professional practice. And so what you see here is to, in response to COVID-19, create a three contingency strategic plan to be submitted to DESE, shared with the community. And I think the important part of that is, and modified as the virus follows its course. So this is, this is a goal that I think is going to warrant constant attention throughout the entire 2021 school year. Um, the district improvement professional practice goal that I've had for several years, um, this is going to just take on new shapes, recognizing an increased need for the move uh, to move the district to a greater proficiency in diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, and anti-racism. I will embark upon a four-pronged plan to grow staff repertoires, explore the curriculum, address students' needs, and align our work in the, with a community effort that might be an appropriate connection. And we talked a little bit about the uh, Hopkinton Freedom Team. And then the last professional practice one is to grow communication between families and the superintendent and grow relationships with uh, elected officials. So are there only three? Nope, <laughs> there will certainly be more as I go through the process of self-reflection and looking at uh, the evaluation and student learning data. And the other piece that is missing at this point in time 
is you know when our principals and central office administrators get our school improvement plans up and running and then we update the district improvement plan uh, then i'll have a much better uh, understanding of what what other work uh, will be set out for me in the coming year. And just to give you a little sense of what our district improvement plan looks like, uh, these are the strategic objectives that we had in place in 2019-20. Um, I would imagine that a lot of, of the uh, pros that you see at the bottom of this page will remain the same. Uh, and these are the things right here that will change. This is what came from the entry planning um, plans for enrollment growth, valuing individual pathways and wellness and building school communities of collaboration. In this document, all of the black font is font that was uh, part of the work that the entire community internally and externally put together. And the green font are things that our schools are working on. I've pulled out the things that I felt like last year we accomplished, and some of the things here in green are things that I know will become ongoing work. So you can see it in page one of that document, and then in page two of that document. Um, the second area uh, are diverse initi diversity initiatives, and the third is communication and stakeholder partnerships. So that's really what our um, district strategic plan um, looks like at this point in time. And you can see that there are gaping holes that the administrators and the admin uh, teams will be filling in as we work through uh, the coming month and through our retreat in August. You also got a paper copy from me earlier and I you know, understand that you've taken a look at that and you can ask any questions you want about it. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Committee members, any questions or comments on the draft, recognizing that it's a draft, an early draft, and thank you for, do, for doing that. I think, um, especially when, when I was first year on the committee, the whole process of goal setting and approval um, was new. So it's nice to actually get the earliest look possible. So as you're um, able to sort of digest it and take it on board, it will make it easier, hopefully. But any questions? Uh, Amanda, I have a question or comment, I guess. Um, the, the three goals, uh, what, what, what I don't see, and I guess a question is, um, is it just because it's taken for granted? What I don't see is like academic focus goals or student achievement focus goals. Uh, these look very operational and logistical. And I guess my question is, to what extent do you feel that um, the goal focus on COVID and community outreach and enrollment, which are all operational things really, uh, how big of a distraction are these gonna be for you and administrators and teachers in fully executing the academic expectations the community has? Yeah, so I'm glad that you've asked that question. The COVID goal, I think, will really have a huge academic piece to it because when we talk about all of that remote learning, um, we had people who were putting out remote learning who were really just kind of, you know, doing what was instinctive to them. And if we are able to reduce the number of school days from 180 to 177 for students, we'll have five days of professional learning and we're taking on a new learning management system to ensure that the instructional pieces around a hybrid or a remote model are really super high quality. And the second thing that I'll say, um, Joe, is that I have to put a student achievement goal in there. And I am kind of reluctant to do that until I hear from the building principals how they like to grow that in their buildings. So for example, at the uh, K to three levels, we have been doing an awful lot of work with um, guided reading and foundation. So kids are getting phonics and phonemic awareness and building that kind of consistency across classrooms. And you know we've probably been doing that work for a couple of years, and we will continue to do that work because that's how important it is for us to you know bolster students' literacy abilities. Um, but those things will you know kind of come out in my work with the principals, and then we'll have a sense of what would be a a good student achievement goal for me. You know, last year, given that document, some of the things that we worked on were things like a career vocational technical goal, a STEAM goal. And um, like, I think that those things were very important because they were reaching a demographic that 
um, historically, you know, we may not have done as well with as we have wanted to, right? Um, and then, you know, Jen Parson was um, working to bring in things like guided inquiry to promote more sort of project-based learning and student autonomy over there, over the kids learning. And I thought that those were important pieces as well. So I kind of do that, you know, picking and choosing thing, like where is it that I want to, you know, put my efforts and certainly the building principals and all the curriculum people are doing their thing as well, but. Okay, good, yeah, glad to hear that's gonna be one of the other Thanks. goals that will be added. Thanks. Yes, for sure. Meg? Yeah, I, I'm so glad that one of the prominent goals is to focus on proficiency and diversity and equity, because I know that this is something we've been talking about for at least the two years I've been on school committee. And I, I know we all recognize that right now in this historical moment, there's a particularly charged need mm -hmm. to attend to this. And I think to attend to it outside of the texts that are assigned in classes, you, you must be aware of the Instagram feed, BIPOC at Hopkinton, mm -hmm. of these heinous incidents of racism in Hopkinton that are ongoing on the street, passed from kid to kid in the hallway that lead to a culture of a whole sector of our population feeling intimidated and unworthy and unloved and disrespected. So to me, especially in light of what's been happening this summer with protests around the country, I think this really needs to feature largely and urgently um, I would go so far as to suggest that the district investigate the notion, if you haven't already, of doing some kind of collective restorative justice week, you know, maybe even the first week of school, getting everybody to talk about it. Because, you know, year after year, it is just pushed under the rug in Hopkinton, and the monoculture continues to reign, and the conversations are not had. And these kids feel disenfranchised and unsafe. And, you know, I'm not sure what the rest of the committee feels about that. But to me, um, after reading these pleas and these moments of indignity that young people are experiencing, being told they smell like curry, you know, being overhearing someone talk about, oh, yeah, let's put on blackface this weekend. This is not right. It is not acceptable. And I'm not sure how we can achieve anything else if we're not attending to the inherent dignity of each student. Well said, Meg. I don't know, Dr. Kavanaugh, if you had anything you wanted to share about your diversity goal at all, or you want to come back to it when you re revisit it? I don't mind showing you um, just one quick slide. I'll, I'll sh I'm going to become the, the screen share extraordinaire for. Uh, um, so this is just something that we have put together as uh, a an administrative team. So you know when we're look, talking about you know these sort of four branches that we need to grow, uh, we've we've talked about these things, and I think that we are very committed this year to being able to do those things. And um, uh, I'm sort of reluctant to say this in a public meeting, but I will because I think that. You know, part of what we wanted to do was to really let the the BIPOC kids know that we are listening. Um, so we are creating a Hopkinton Public Schools Instagram account so that we can we can follow them and let them know that we are in fact listening. You know, we are very attentive, and um, you know, part of what we're doing with that information is is sharing it internally because I think when we actually hear their voices, um, it. It brings uh, the people who are um, very, very concerned out and, and we start to have those kinds of conversations, Meg, that I think you're talking about. So I'll just quickly go through these four things. The first is to diversify our workforce, um, to increase racial and ethnic diversity among our teachers and staff. And you know, it's, it's a long process because when you are working in a community where the um, teacher and administrator and paraprofessional workforce are, you know, predominantly white, uh, they t 
tend to stay in their positions. So it's only really through retirement or uh, when someone moves away through attrition that we have the opportunity to hire in positions. But we are certainly, um, I think, attracting uh, more diverse candidates and hiring more diverse candidates. So we will keep that good work up. Uh, last year, I don't know if you remember, but Jen Parson did a really nice job um, conducting a, a job fair in district. And we had districts from, you know, representatives from eight different districts, um, as I recall, and plenty of people who are out looking for teaching positions. Um, our second one is to actually grow our curriculum. And we are thinking about maybe creating coursework at a particular grade level, um, and then bringing in uh, trainers for other grade levels. And we think that that's really important. And this, this would be work directly with students, not this is the work that we need to do for the faculty or this is what we need to do for the administrative team, but really bring in people to work directly with our students to um, have these kinds of conversations about uh, anti-racism, social justice, uh, privilege, all of those pieces. Um, so the second is to grow our curricula. We will be finding entry points in all of our curricula where are places that we can have those kinds of conversations in classrooms? So K to 12, where we are talking about um, social justice and diversity and celebrating culture or whatever is developmentally appropriate in a classroom. Uh, we will be celebrating bright spots. And by that we mean when we find places where teachers are doing some amazing things um, in classrooms and taking risks and um, bringing out uh, aspects of the curriculum that would you know, otherwise be kind of uh, glossed over. Those things will be brought out so that all teachers can see what um, the, their you know, exceptionally performing counterparts and peers are doing. And then the third is to really look at text choices six to 12. I know I've told you many times that we do that K to five. Um, the third part is to formally train all teachers and parents and recognizing implicit bias and talking about race. What we think is that very frequently teachers would love to be having these conversations, but they're not sure that they have the language to do it. So we're going to sort of uh, fill the toolboxes of our teachers. Um, we had a meeting yesterday with the director of student services, the assistant superintendent, uh, Jen Sucker, who you met tonight, who would be working in um, equity and access, uh, and I. Uh, we had a lovely in-person meeting and talked about uh, where the funding sources to make those things right there happen. And then finally connecting to the community, um, meeting with the Hopkinton Freedom Team. I know that you see uh, people's names attached to this and that is, you know, I don't want you to think that those are the limitations of people, but those are the people who have sort of stepped up and said, I would be really happy to sort of navigate that leaf of the tree. So that's, that's really where we are with that. You mind if I add one thing in, Carol? No, please do, Jen. Um, the only thing I'd like to add, and you've obviously covered um, much ground there, is that based on a grant that we received this past year that, Carol, I know you worked to receive for us, um, that was kind of determined to be allocated for SEL and um, cultural proficiency work, we have ordered probably uh, almost $100,000 worth of texts for our district and some of those texts, kind of to your point, Meg, are for staff, for growing our proficiency, for growing our comfort level with having difficult conversations, especially those around the topic of race. But the vast majority of those books are designed to make sure that we put books in the hands of students with characters, with problems, with um, themes that represent a very diverse um, kind of uh, cohort for our students to begin work with and for our teachers to start to dig into. So, um, you know, with Carol's direction this past year, we have already started to kind of um, interrogate the curriculum and look for some real areas of deficiency and where we can um, begin to kind of fill those gaps and make sure that our students have literature as soon as this year begins um, that feels much more representative of our student population. That's great. And, and I thank you all for your work. I hope that the teachers will also do a lot of role play um, so students can learn how to be an ally um, in these difficult situations because that's really a big problem. People are remaining silent because they feel awkward. They don't know what to say when they see something or hear something. So I think acting it out prepares them for it. Just my two cents or my 12 cents, what have you. 
Any other comments on K Dr. Kavanaugh's goals? Yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea how I can follow Meg's impassioned plea <laughs> because uh, I'm sure you're all aware that that's really, really important to me too. I am very heartened to see it uh, get such focus in the goals and to see that four-pronged uh, attack piece. And uh, I'm looking forward to these kind of difficult discussions moving forward on all of this. So thank you. I'm on mute. Nancy, do you have any comments or questions? I, I do not really accept to, I actually, I, I do have a comment now that I think about it. Um, so much of the work that has been done on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the past couple of years has been a, largely quieter because it's been done at a higher level with administrators. I think it's great uh, to see it kind of moving down now that we've advanced to that next stage. Uh, and I also think, uh, phenomenal that we were able to use that grant money to purchase um, those texts. So in, encouraging, um, as both Meg and Leah had said so. Well, that was countless hours on Mrs. Parson's part, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Parson, your name has appeared on many, many committees tonight. We've seen you. <laughs> uh -huh. You're not sleeping much in the coming year, I don't think, Ooh. or this Ooh. summer. Yes, these are busy times for all of us, but I know. all good work, important work. Thank you. Yeah, Nancy, I want to echo sort of your comments a little bit about diversity and then a comment on the COVID goal that um, when I first started, I think, and Dr. Kavanaugh was new as well, it, Dr. Kavanaugh immediately put diversity on her radar as one of the goals. And I was one of those people who was kind of like, well, can't we have something more tangible as a measurable outcome? Can it go a little faster? I didn't quite get it. Um, and now in retrospect, I feel so thankful that we have, we, I haven't done anything, they have done um, some difficult work in creating from the top down a common language, a common understanding of um, what it means to have implicit bias, what it means to be, you know, sort of all this, all that we're talking about now, I think two years ago, was equally prevalent, but even that much more difficult to discuss. People didn't come to the table with the same understanding of the issues. And because of the groundwork, the book studies that you've done, the training with the admin and so forth, I think our administration and our teachers are in a place to really hit the ground running now. And had we not done that work, I feel like we would be scrambling to catch up. And you know, when, when you think about asking a teacher to intervene when they see something in a classroom. If we haven't taught the teacher how to assess what they've witnessed, how to intervene in a way that's healthy and educational for both parties, especially when the students are young, um, but all students, um, then we were nowhere because the teacher needs that training just as, you know, we have to start with the teachers and the admin. So I think um, I give a lot of credit to you, Dr. Kavanaugh, for taking the approach that you've taken because I think now, as the community around us has um, created this very loud outcry, we're ready to go. And, I, and I'm excited about the idea of, of getting more into the meat of it in the classroom and so forth. So anyway, um, on the COVID goal, the only thing, uh, and I had mentioned this to you, Dr. Kavanaugh, before, um, it kind of it, it goes along with what Joe was saying about student achievement. I think um, I'd love to see the wording of that goal um, maybe I mean, you have to do that plan anyway. That's kind of like, you don't really get a choice. Um, but I think what makes it a goal for, for me, for you, is that um, well, we're committed to um, adhering to the values that are important to us. I think you started the work with the admin team around a set of core values as we move into COVID and what we don't want to let go of, student achievement and wellness. And I mean, you've got sort of your set of values, but certainly I want to adhere to those with the solutions. And also address, because you've done such a good job of soliciting feedback from our spring, um, have our work this year factor in the learnings, which I know you're gonna do anyway, so we might as well you know, call out the few learnings that we've, we've heard from the community 
maybe improve consistency, maybe better access to um, a common learning management system or something. I know a lot of families struggled with two and three different learning management systems. Whatever it is that we've learned, factor that into the goal um, wording so that our goal is really a Hopkinton goal because we did such a great job in the spring with the scramble that we had, but of course we've now identified ways to do it even better. So that's my only thought on the, on the goal for the COVID. No, that is kind of a little bit entertaining because really, you know, even though I'm thinking about things like how many kids can be put in a bus, what I've really been passionate about, and I was gonna say poor, poor Jen um, and poor show Ghost will tell you that I'm, you know, kind of nutty about how we're pushing out instruction remotely, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I won't say any more. <laughs> Actually, I think it's really been um, a very collaborative effort and um, really you don't always see superintendents that have that curriculum background like Carol does. And I think we're really fortunate to have that, but I will say that, um, you know, for example, today we just put out a survey to our faculty to see who has what kinds of experience with remote instruction and, you know, including what happened this past spring and where we, or, or what other types of professional experiences they might have, because really what we are looking at and talking about is pedagogy and how do you instruct and what makes the most sense in terms of developing learners and developing understanding, whether we're remote or in person. And um, I think we have a lot of people, I'm already seeing responses um, from our faculty who are very willing to come in this summer and help us with that planning. And you know, I think we had many, many bright spots in our curriculum this spring, especially considering with the, you know, the rapid turnaround of producing. Uh, remote instruction, but you know we know we can continue to enhance that, and that planning has already started, and that really is um, has a lot to do with with um, our superintendent's background and expertise. Well, thank you, Jen. But we wouldn't be anywhere without you and Ashok. Let me tell you. And I think <laughs> you know, you know, both, both Joe and Leah mentioned you know the 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 two sides of I think where we focus you know equally it, student achievement and student wellness, and I think and and. Likewise, faculty wellness and faculty achievement as well. And so I think just making sure that I think that those are in your values, but just keeping that commitment um, as we look to what we hope to accomplish with our interesting COVID delivery models this year. And there probably will be so many of them. But All right. So I think that's it for superintendent goals. I think we are now moving on to item D, uh, the MASC anti-racism resolution to Nancy. Yes, so the, and I don't know if everybody got this email, although certainly I think Joe and Leah probably did not because it came out before they joined the committee, but it didn't make it quite in time to get into the packet last time, but the MASC, which for our, um, our viewing audience is the Mass Association of School Committees, came out with this school committee anti-racism uh, anti resolution. And I thought it would be worthy of us to take a look at to see if we would like to adopt that uh, to really kind of stand in line with some of the work that's being done in our district uh, and work that has certainly been expressed, uh, people having interest in, in our community. So I, I, it is in the packet for people viewing from home as well as obviously for all of you. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll speak to it uh, through you, the chair, Amanda. I, I, um, I guess in the context of what Meg already said and Leah said and others on the previous topic, uh, obviously it's important to the district and uh, it, 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 jumping on this statement that's out there from the state there, the uh, committee, um, it's the least we can do, I think, to express our, our agreement with that direction. Any other comments? Yeah, I, I really love that these are actionable. Like I, I like that, you know, it, it's one thing to have a pledge that is just, oh, we believe in this. It's another thing to really talk about recruiting and retaining diversity and looking at the policies and um, looking at the curriculum. So I, I, I really like the fact that this particular pledge has actionable items in it that allow us to demonstrate that we are holding to the principles and not just saying that we're holding to the principles. I agree with you, Leah. Actually, that was one of the things that struck me at first is that, that this is something we need to not only 
pledge verbally to, but to really follow through with the actionable items in there. Do we want to make a motion to accept this if there's no more conversation? I make a motion to accept it. I, I second. second. <laughs> motion by Meg, second by Leah. I think I need to do a roll call vote. Yes. Um, so, uh, Leah? Yes. Aye. Joe? No. Aye. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes as well, so it's unanimous. And thank you so much for bringing this forward. Um, I, I agree with all the comments that were made, so I think this is great. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. That brings us to, um, ooh, liaison roles. We have, um, I'm just doing a time check because we have two, um, sort of housekeeping activities for school committee, the liaison roles and the group norms. Are we okay to forge ahead? We're a little behind schedule. So typically what we've done the last couple of years is we did not actually um, it, like vote and make these final, but really just kind of put them out there as kind of discussion. And I, and I know this was brought to my attention that Joe and Leah appear to have been signed up for a lot of things, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is not actually the case that those as um, those of us who were there last year recall, I think what just happened is that their names got swapped out with Nina and Jen. It's a new so member, you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, we should put every single one with the new people. There we go. Uh, but I, I'm fine with whatever you want to do, Amanda. Okay, so let's let's introduce each each topic and then we'll hold it for a vote at the next meeting. Um, so liaison roles um, in the packet, I believe you saw, um, as Nancy mentioned, the list of uh, typical liaison positions. Um, just pulling that up myself. Um, some of these I think no longer exist and maybe we wanna just call those out first. Um, and then um, beyond that, you can see a brief description and then a time commitment for each one. And we kind of like to spread these out among the committee so that nobody has you know, too much to do. Um, and in many cases, there's sort of an alternate. So if one of us is the actual point person and can't attend, there can often be an alternate who can go in their stead. So maybe I'll just quickly go through the list. And if um, committee members realize that there is no longer a need for a committee, or working group in many cases, um, please say so. So the media spokesperson uh, role, uh, Nancy has, and Mina also filled that very nicely. Um, that is the, the job of being the mouthpiece of the school committee, replying to emails on our collective behalf, um, of course, always with the committee position, not as an individual, um, monitoring and often um, providing information effects as needed on Facebook or social media as appropriate, et cetera. Um, I imagine that I will be doing that as chair. I imagine I'll be calling on Nancy for guidance. <laughs> uh, legislators, that's a liaison role with our legislators. I typically falls to the chair, but we can certainly discuss that. Um, budget advisory group. Um, this is the group that meets throughout the year to uh, plan the budget. And in this case, um, the work was repeated several iterations worth. So um, I think we typically have chair and vice chair on that, but again, we can have conversations about it um, at the next meeting. School committee minutes review, very sad that Jen is gone. She has done that the whole time I've been here, but the minutes are, are the meetings are recorded and the minutes are put together in draft form for us. And then we need to review them, make any corrections or adjustments and then vote to accept them. And that's the role that Jen played, which is now open. Um, procedures working group, that is a group to work on any school committee based work that we might want to document a procedure for. So last year, one of the main uh, ones that we worked on was the superintendent review process. And Mina and I put together a procedure for that, which um, we implemented this year. So this is really about improving the efficiency and effectiveness of school committee. Um, the school committee menu website did not have any action this year. I think there was um, 
quite a bit of time in the beginning of the year where the um, tech department was stabilizing after the rollout of the new uh, website. But I believe this is an, uh, an opportunity for us to look at our, our presence on the school committee on the uh, district website and decide what information we want to put um, under our tab. We haven't done that, and I think it's something worth doing for sure. Um, under voting membership committees, the Irvine Tadaro Committee, does that still, is that active? So I believe that's an ongoing uh, town committee that has to be disbanded by town meeting, but it, it meets very infrequently. Meg, okay. Meg, you did that last year, right? Yes, I've done it for two years and I, I really love that role. I find it very fulfilling. Does it meet frequently? No, we've never met. <laughs> but I'm ready. All right, <laughs> so we'll leave it on the list. Um, the Tech Collaborative, uh, I believe last year, Dr. Kavanaugh stepped up as our representative. I have no idea if that's... I, yeah, something. I think you guys might, might have just voted me both the Tech and the Accept representative. And would you be looking to be voted for that again if we wanted to? You may or, have already done that. Oh, for this year? Yes, I think so, because I think that they require that, that we do that. We... Like, we Correct, but we also typically have a school committee member who is the non-voting member who goes to that. I think Mina did it the past couple of years. Um, Marathon Fund Committee. Any, what, who served on that this year? Mina did, and I, from what I understand, that's actually a very fun committee because they're giving out money, like right. scholarship type money. Yeah. And the elementary school building committee, are they, did they even disband yet, did they? No, no we is, have the chair. That is, that is still active. Uh, I'm still the chair of that. Um, and it still needs two other school committee members. Okay. <laughs> so you can't do double duty? I, I'm a appointed member from the selectmen. Okay. And the, the charter of that committee requires two school committee members. Well, generally only one school committee member attends, but the other is available as an alternate. So now in the case that I'm also on the school committee, I would be there as the, the, the at-large person on the elementary school building committee, obviously also from school committee, and then there'd be one other school committee member there, just as there, there has been in the past. Okay. Um, the turf field committee, I believe Nancy, you served on that? Correct. And that is, that's the oversight and the management of it, not the actual building of it. So that does continue to be meeting. And the bridge committee also, Nancy, you've been on um, looking at yes. supporting the socioeconomic challenges in our community. Um, this calendar subcommittee, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, is there any need to have any additional discussion work with this committee or do we need to vote to disband it at some point? No, we, that committee is, th they sort of disbanded themselves, I believe. So yes, you can vote to disband that committee. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's my dog. Let's see, the policy working group, um, that is the best committee. I've been on that for two years. I highly recommend it. No, really, it is a, um, it's a great assignment. Um, I highly recommend it for anyone who has an interest in the policy work. There's um, usually quite a lot to be done in the course of a year. Uh, so it sort of speaks for itself that those are actually policies for the district. Unlike the procedure working group, which was our operational efficiency, this is uh, district procedures, or sorry, policies rather. And then liaison roles, we have the Youth Commission, Planning Board, Appropriation Committee, Select Board, Capital Improvements, um, the Growth Study Committee. I believe that work continues, does it not? Have they disbanded? I don't know. I think they're still working. Jody, do you know? At I all? don't know, but I, I, would, I would imagine they're still working. Yeah, I think so too. Um, CPAC. Um, HOP Organizing for Prevention, uh, which I have served on, and they are definitely going to, they will definitely want a school committee liaison. And the Community Communications Group, Mina has typically done that. 
Um, it is a group coordinated through HCAM, I believe, that uh, works on getting uh, the various um, organizations in town to communicate, to cross, it's, it's a forum to have communication with other organizations in town, really. And then there's a, an ability to leverage HCAM often for communication. So that is the list we currently have. Um, if you guys have any immediate questions, please ask, and otherwise we'll just come back to this next week after we can think about it. Can I make just a quick suggestion as I'm looking through the list that maybe we could, those of us who have been on some of these committees, the ones that meet at regular times, it might be nice to have noted because there might be some that we're interested in, but if you can't meet, like I think the community communications meets in the day, which might be more challenging for some or versus one that typically meets in the evening. Just a, a thought. Yeah, knowing when they meet would help, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask that too. I don't know who owns this document. I don't have edit privileges, but um, Georgette owns it. Okay, so uh, we can just send it to Georgette. Yeah. And have her. Update. Can I can I add one group for consideration? Uh, I just got an email from the Freedom Team as well, asking for a liaison from the school committee, and they were asking me to join. Um, so I would I would like for that to be a consideration as well. Great. That should go on the list definitely. Yep. Okay, so I think we'll just come back to that at the next meeting. Um, you try to think of one or two that are of interest and hopefully we'll be able to share the wealth and um, have good coverage. So back to the agenda. I think we're on um, norms, school committee norms. The school committee norms, oops, apologies. Uh, this is a document that we put together and then the school committee agrees um, every year, makes any edits that the new members or an existing members see fit. It, it is a document that provides some parameters to guide our work as school committee members. A lot of it is very sort of bread and butter, um, but uh, it is important to state in a document um, sort of how we do what we do as a committee. So I... I think everyone can read through this. Uh, I don't know if we wanna, well, I guess I'll just read through each one quickly and we'll um, decide whether we can vote them tonight or if we wanna take them at a future time. Uh, so the first one is the educational welfare and achievement of all students will remain uppermost in mind of school committee members at all times. Second, when rendering decisions about any topic, school committee members will consider all stakeholders and how their decision impacts the role, their roles in all our schools. We have a commitment to taxpayers to optimize resources and meet our fiduciary responsibilities. Number three, school committee members represent the community and will make themselves available and accountable to the community. School committee members set the example for promoting a positive image for our school system. Number four, to these ends, we must strive toward transparency in all our decision making. The superintendent and the school committee members must communicate to each other all pertinent matters in a timely manner. Number five, while the chair or vice chair represents the public voice of the school committee, no one voice has greater authority than any other. No unilateral decisions will be made without consulting the other members. We will abide by the practice that all public statements regarding school committee actions or decisions will be communicated through the chair or her designee, or his or her designee, actually, which is, or there. We should change that. Uh, number six, members will behave with respect toward each other and strive to reach decisions by consensus. If consensus is not possible, all members will publicly abide by the majority decision. Number seven, members will exercise leadership in vision, planning, policy, making evaluation and advocacy on behalf of the students in the district, not in managing the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Number eight, members will conduct business through a set agenda. Emerging items will be addressed in subsequent meetings through agenda items. If members would like to put an item on the agenda or have questions about items, they will notify the school committee chair or superintendent in advance of the meeting. Number nine, members must exercise critical thinking and sound judgment and decision-making relying upon available facts. Members must not surrender that judgment to individuals or special interest groups. Number 10, members will attend meetings while prepared to discuss issues on the agenda and will be prepared to make decisions striving for efficient decision-making. Number 11, members will understand and respect the chain of command. While the committee is eager to listen to its constituents and staff, each inquiry is to be directed to the superintendent and or his, and his or her designee. 
And number 12, individual school committee members will take no private action that will compromise the school committee or administration and respect the confidentiality of information that is privileged under applicable law. Those are the norms that we are we have been operating under. Does anyone, if there's a lot of discussion, then I will hold till the next meeting if people are very comfortable with these and we can vote them tonight. I just have a question on number five about the communication. Mm -hmm. So does that mean like if it's on the public record, I can't emphasize one piece of it and like put it up on like my Facebook page or something. Like I, I'm just trying to get a feel for what what the messaging information is. Um, just because, for instance, the pledge would be really nice to put up and have everyone see, even if they didn't come to the meeting. Would that be something then that the that the chair would do, or would we be able to do that as well? Like that's the sort of thing that I'm asking about. Oh, I, I would say that any decision that has been made by the committee or any public document that, that represented the committee has voted on that represents the committee, you can share, certainly. I mean, okay. we, we've, okay. you, you, if we had voted, say we had voted not to adopt that pledge, then you wouldn't want, you couldn't put that out as a school committee um, pledge and represent okay. a school committee when it's not. Nancy, do you have any okay. comments that it would clarify? You have much more experience with this than I have. I agree with, with what you're saying, Amanda. And I think from a practical standpoint, I routinely share stuff on my Facebook page that came out of our meetings, uh, just because I think it helps get the word around in different avenues. So that, for example, Leah, you probably have different, different people following your school committee page than I do, uh, or Meg, or you know whoever else. But I, you know, I wouldn't take something that was not a publicly made decision right. and put it out there. I, I often will post packets and things like that are informational that are kind of coming up, but those are parts of public, public uh, documents. Right. So, so I guess I was, yeah, I was trying to understand what communications are limited to the chair and the vice chair, as opposed to what general com uh, members could give. So, so I have an understanding now of what I can share, but what does it mean about limiting the communication? As, a norm, so, as an operating norm, we have typically, we get emails to the school committee. We all get the emails. Typically, the chair will respond on our behalf with okay. sort of one response to whoever is inquiring. It doesn't mean, I mean, this isn't, it doesn't mean that you know maybe you couldn't respond, but typically the chair responds and is the voice um, to any communication that comes into the school committee as a body. Okay, now I understand. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Or if Can there was something. something... Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I can say if you had if if there's ever a question, I mean you can you can always ask. But I think you know there's sort of these are our general operating norms is that we have for consistency and for the ease of understanding of the community of where to get information, we typically designate one person to be the mouthpiece. Nancy, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to say that it, it, yes to what you said, but and also if, you know, something big happened in the community that required a, a response from the community, from the school committee, where we were not able to do a group or group thing because we didn't have a publicly posted meeting, it would come from the chair. Okay. That all, that all makes sense. Thank you very much for clarifying. Amanda, I think that um, it's great to see these norms uh, and to know that you've already been followed in the past. I mean, if, if the committee's ready, I would be willing to make a motion to accept these. I, I Can I just interject? Because I'm feeling some consternation. I love these norms because we, I remember crafting them at length <laughs> two years ago. But Great I have noticed, my friends, that in number 10, we have a compound word that is missing a hyphen. And I'm feeling two years of accumulated distress that I didn't notice that. So please put a hyphen in decision making. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that you are the one that catches these things for all of us. You have righted the wrong. Two years. Thank you. I, I, Okay, so we have a motion to accept with the amendment um, the norms as written. Is there a, a second? second? Second by Leah. Motion by Joe, second by Leah. I need to do a roll call vote. So, Leah? Yes. 
Joe? Yes. Meg? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Sorry, I was muted. And I'm a yes, so that's unanimous, and our norms pass with the amended um, correction. Okay, great. Um, back to the agenda. Let's see. Um, uh, item G did not uh, sort of joint statement on COVID-19 precautions. This is a something that I reached out to um, our director of public health. I am um, looking ahead at the calendar. I see the graduation ceremony on the calendar for August 2nd. And um, I see uh, or hear a large outcry from the community of a need to get back to school. And I see what's happening in um, many of the parts of the country where people under the age of 30 are um, just going out and trying to live life. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way in COVID time. So I had actually reached out um, asking if there might be a statement to help guide behavior of individuals. There has been a lot of like, how do you open a business? Um, but not so much about what's sort of risky, moderately risky, and, and just too and not risky at all, sort of a continuum of behaviors that we could maybe help the community digest so that we can behave in a way that will enable us to open the schools and so forth. Um, we haven't received that, uh, they're, they're working on it, we haven't received it yet, but I do think that there are families who are looking for some more help in understanding how we open up as families in phase three. What does phase three mean for a family? Um, and how can we do that safely and optimize our chances of uh, moving forward? But we have not received it yet, so um, we'll hold off on that. I'm not equipped to do that kind of a statement. It has to come from public health. So old business, um, I think we don't have any old business, as far as I can tell. Do we have any additional public comments, Dr. Kavanaugh? Have you or Nancy, have you received any texts? I have not received any texts. OK. Um, future agenda items. Do any committee members have any items they would like to see on future agendas? We know we have several items that will be rolling forward. Obviously, the reopening, um, superintendent goals. These are going to be, you know, we're just beginning those discussions. But if, if there are any other things that come up, um, you can just shoot me an email or Dr. Kavanaugh um, if, if something comes up in the interim. Okay. And items by consensus. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. As superintendent, I recommend the school committee approve the items by consensus as listed on your agenda. So moved. Second. A motion by Nancy, second by Meg. A roll call vote. Leah? Aye. Yes. Joe? Aye. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm yes, so that's a unanimous. And the last item is adjournment. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion by Meg? Second. Second by Nancy. I think I need a roll call vote. Leah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joe? Aye. Meg? Aye. Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes, so it's unanimous. We are adjourned at uh, 921. I apologize for running a long meeting on my first one. This is not a good precedent to set. Um, next meeting is July 23rd at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, Ms. Parson, Ms. Rothermick, and committee. And thank you, new chair and new vice chair, and welcome to Joe and Leah. It's lovely to have you here. Thank Agree you. on all that. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much, Amanda. Night. Thank Good you, night. Nancy. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.